were it not so overused in titles for conference papers to the extent that it's become um, something of a cliché. Can you hear me? Oh, that's better. Uh, that to the extent that it's become some, something of a cliché, I might have called this paper a tale of two cities, for that's certainly what it is, a tale of two very different cities and of how they contribute to our understanding of the Crusader period and the Latin East, and of some of the difficulties and challenges facing us in studying them. Jerusalem and Acre in, are indeed very different cities, rather like Jerusalem and Tel Aviv are today. One, an inland city, a city of government, proud, somewhat laid back, conservative, seeming almost as if it wishes not to taint itself with everyday things, and most important, a holy city. The other, a port city, cosmopolitan, lively, bursting with activity, ever expanding, full of foreign visitors, full of merchants, of merchandise, crowded, filthy, something of an unholy city. Because of their almost equal importance during the Crusader period and because they were so very different from one another, Jerusalem and Acre are the main focus for scholars studying the Kingdom of Jerusalem and Frankish urban life in the 12th and 13th centuries. Acre was first and foremost a port city, the chief port not only of the kingdom but of the entire Latin East. It was the centre of Frankish local and international commerce. It was the residence of the Italian merchant communes. Over time it became the second home of the chief military orders um, and uh, eventually the house of two new military orders, the German Teutonic Order and the, order, the English order known as St. Thomas Becket, the order of St. Thomas Becket. Following the loss of Jerusalem and the hinterland of the kingdom after the Battle of Hattin in 1187, Acre replaced Jerusalem as the administrative capital and became the principal residence of the king, the patriarch, and many of the monastic houses. And it was also a regional capital. Jerusalem was the holy city the place of Christ's crucifixion, burial, resurrection, the motivation indeed behind the Crusader movement, and it became to a greater degree than before the focus of renewed Christian pilgrimage. But from the time of its conquest on the 15th of July, 1099, it also became the seat of government, capital of the, and administrative center of the kingdom, the place of residence of the king, the seat of the, judicial, the chief judicial and administrative body, the Hort Kul, the center of church administration, the residence of the patriarch, headquarters of the military orders, the location of many monastic houses, and in addition, it too served as a regional center, a regional capital at the center of the kingdom. So as a starting point, with regard to their functions, these are two very different cities though with certain similarities. With regard to their histories and the way in which events occurred in the Latin East and how they affected them, they're very different indeed. Acre was occupied by the army of Baldwin I and the Genoese fleet in 1104 and remained in Frankish hands until it fell to the Mamluks in 1291, with the exception of the years 1187, between the years 1187 and 1191, when it was in Ayyubid hands. That is a total of 183 years of Frankish occupation. Jerusalem was Frankish for less than half that period, from the time of its occupation by the armies of the First Crusade in, Ju in July 1099 until early October 1187 when it was taken by Saladin, and Frankish again briefly between 1229 when it was regained through diplomacy by Frederick II and 1244 when it finally fell to the Hawizmian hordes. A total of 103 years, eight decades less than Acre. But perhaps most relevant to this discussion is what happened to these cities after they fell to the Muslims. When Jerusalem was captured by the Ayyubids in 1187, in October 1187, it suffered substantial damage to the northern defences, although probably only to specific parts, mainly the moat and the east, northeastern defences and damage to the interior of the city was probably mainly localized to uh, 
certain buildings like the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, which was only partly damaged, and more substantial damage to other churches, some of which were completely dismantled, and considerable damage to the hospital and Templar compounds. In the interim, between uh, or following the occupation and until the Franks recovered Jerusalem in 1229, additional damage occurred, most notably the substantial dismantling of sections of fortifications carried out by al Isa in 1219. Uh, on this slide you can see the uh, apparent line of the dismantling, uh, which can still be observed when examining the wall, uh, with the 11th century Fatima fortifications the fortifications used by the Franks in the 12th century um, below the line and with the um, Ottoman 16th century and, and post 16th century construction above. Um, in 1239, the city was briefly occupied by, by Al Muazzam's son, Al Malik al Nasser Daoud of Kerak, and additional damage was done to the walls and the citadel. According to Al Nasser, al -Nasser Daoud himself, whose account is obviously somewhat exaggerated, the citadel was completely dismantled. There are also other sources, including the Rothland continuation of William of Tyre, which support the, the view of, of considerable damage to fortifications and to the citadel. In 1244, with the final fall of Jerusalem to the Chorizmians, no doubt additional destruction was carried out to the Frankish structures. Some of these events were certainly responsible for the complete disappearance of major buildings in the city, such as the Royal Palace, which stood next to the citadel, and of which only fragmentary remains of the basement levels have been found in excavations. Most of the rest disappeared, uh, or most of the rest of the disappearance of Frankish Jerusalem is less the result of intentional acts than the, course, the natural course of events. The continued use of Jerusalem as a living city, the use and gradual decline of of its structures and their replacement over time. Acre is an entirely different story. When it was occupied by Saladin in 1187, having quickly fallen, it probably, it probably suffered comparatively little damage. However, after substantial destruction to the Mamluk, uh, or during the Mamluk siege, the entire city was intentionally dismantled as part of the Mamluk scorched earth policy. All of the defences and most of the buildings within them were dismantled and only, uh, and almost only, the basement and ground floor levels survive in the city interior. And you can see some of these on this uh, um, uh, panoramic view of the city from the 17th century. Um, uh, and the outer suburbs like, uh, um, suffered even more so. Like the walls themselves, they were more intensely dis dis uh, destroyed. Additional extensive destruction occurred with the Turkish efforts in the late 18th and early 19th centuries to remove any substantial remains outside the walls so that they should not be used by the enemy to surreptitiously approach the new walls. Well, that's the remnants that you can see from buildings outside the city walls. And the white line here represents the um, position of the Frankish walls. Um, finally, the surviving remains as they existed were built over, as can be seen in this photograph, aerial photograph, um, or incorporated in new buildings in the 19th century and through the 20th century, whatever survived underground was built over as the city expanded to the north and the east. The outcome of these very different histories affects to no small degree the work of the archaeologist. In Akko, much of the remains are buried under modern structures. They might be inaccessible, partly or entirely, and they're often abandoned or used for disposing of rubbish. And this is a sort of very typical um, picture of what exists within Crusader structures underneath the city. Um, in Jerusalem, Frankish remains are in many cases, of course not in all cases, but in many cases still standing above ground, particularly public buildings, and sometimes still functioning in their original, even in their original functions. In Acre, we find considerable remains of domestic buildings and installations, while in Jerusalem there are comparatively few of these, once again because they were continually used and deteriorated over time, whereas those in Acre were buried under rubble and preserved. The more recent history of these cities is also significant 
and also significantly, significantly influences the possibilities and the limitations for the archaeologist, the fact that Akko is, has been a city within the Jewish state since 1948 and its Arab population have been Israeli citizens for two decades longer than those of the old city of Jerusalem is important, as is the cumbersome religious, political and emotional baggage of Jerusalem as a holy city of three religions. How does that relate to the work of the archaeologist wishing to carry out excavations and surveys? Let me give a few personal examples. In the mid-1990s, I carried out a survey of houses in Acre as a part of a research for my PhD study of domestic buildings of the Frankish period, and I was met with almost universal hospitality by the local residents, who generally gave me free reign to examine their houses. Indeed, the greatest difficulty I faced during my survey was avoiding giving offence by refusing yet another cup of coffee offered to me by the house owners as they showed me around. Carrying out a similar survey in Jerusalem, I was never threatened by the danger of caffeine poisoning. The house owners were generally suspicious and far less cooperative. I once took a group of students to show them a, an inscribed insignia carved on a building south of David Street in Jerusalem. This is an emblem of the Templar Order. There are several of these scattered through the city as well as emblems of the Teutonic Order from the 13th century in that case. Um, and they identify properties that belonged to the military orders and that had to pay them rent or, or taxes. And I pointed this out to the students and gave them an explanation. The Arab owner of a shop opposite was very outspoken in opposing my explanation, perhaps motivated partly by the fact that the building now houses a small mosque. And the next time I came, I found that the insignia had been neatly cemented over and the offending evidence hidden from, from view. And of course, in a city of not inconsiderable religious tension, problematic attitudes exist on all sides. After the Six-Day War, Jerusalem's mayor, Teddy Kollek, designated a small ruined church and, archeolo and ar other archeological remains in the Jewish quarter, uh, formerly the church of Santa Maria al Manorum, St. Mary of the Germans, to be opened as a public archeological garden or archeological park. And for many years, it indeed served that purpose and was open to all and could be visited. However, since, uh, or in 1999, the church was sold to an, a certain Orthodox Jewish seminary in circumstances which we might term not entirely kosher. This seminary had, by the, way, by the way, already purchased another medieval church, 12th century church. St. Mary now underwent what might be regarded as a conversion to Judaism, having a mezuzah, or a parchment scroll with excerpts of the Torah, placed on its doorpost, and gradually, by stages, was entirely cut off from public viewing, and has remained so ever since, used for, by the seminary as storage and for private functions. These episodes highlight some of the very different attitudes that archaeologists are occasionally faced with and that complicate surveys, excavations, and research. No side is blameless in the occasional use of archaeology as a political and religious tool, and it's by no means a new phenomenon. Archaeology was used by the Europeans in the 19th and 20th centuries as a means of justifying their involvement in the region and aiding in the establishment, for example, of the British and French mandates by, uh, by exposing the Frankish presence that had existed in the past. And it's used by Middle Easterners today, by politicians, by all three monastic faiths, each for their own purpose and for their own perceived benefits. It would be far better if archaeological research were used to break down barriers rather than to create them. On a positive note, if I'm not mistaken, a certain effort has been made in Akko to involve the residents, who are mostly Muslims, in the town in taking an interest in the Crusader past and awakening in them an understanding of the value and importance of that period in the history of the city, even though they're probably uh, by no means descendants of the Franks. Archaeology can serve as a way of enabling different communities in a city to appreciate the heritage that we all share. But the difficulties facing archaeologists do not only relate to religious 
uh, to religion and politics. A major hurdle in examining or in excavating within a city is a much more prosaic but no less fundamental one, what we might call the nuisance factor. And it's a two-sided sword. On the one hand, excavations have a major impact and an often, often a detrimental one on daily life and as such require a great deal of diplomacy in order to preserve goodwill. Archaeologists working in Jerusalem and Akko, as indeed in any town, can testify to the tensions that sometimes arise and the need to work in an area where people are trying to live their daily lives and regard the archaeologist's presence as bothersome. On the other hand, for the archaeologist, excavations in a city are made much more difficult by the inaccessibility of areas that are heavily built up. Existing buildings often prevent archaeological excavations altogether or greatly limit their extent, as any archaeologist working in Jerusalem certainly would, would be able to witness. In 1999 and 2000, I excavated an area in Akko, east of the old city, with the aim of discovering the location of the house of the German military order, the Teutonic Knights. As the area we, that we excavated, and that indeed proved to be the site, proved in the long run to be indeed the site of the Teutonic order, was located in a built up section of the city. Um, there were several private houses, um, several private houses, um, four large apartment buildings, a large abandoned a bakery, a working factory, an asphalt playing ground, a paved street, and two cemeteries. And we were required to with work within that framework and to find little small spaces that we could open up and narrow trenches in between. The area is marked on green on the, on the map here. Um, which of course made it quite difficult to get any sort of overall picture of the complex we were excavating. For another example, in 1999, um, when I went to take a look at the location north of the Turkish walls of Akko, where Pro Professor Benjamin Kedar had discovered on old aerial photographs what appeared to be a large public building, which is what you see on the right hand. I apologize for the quality of this slide. It's a copy of a, a 19, uh, early 1920s aerial photograph of Akko of a building within that area. And um, what, what you can see appears to be something like a, a bazaar, a covered market street or something like that, quite possibly. Um, but what I found was that the northern third of it was inaccessible because it was covered over with a police compound. Um, the south was paved over with an asphalt parking lot and the central section with a health clinic and a paved street, which once again left almost nothing that could be observed. Since that examination, some sex, small, very limited sections of this construction have been discovered. So these are the sort of problems that um, occur when you're excavating within a built-up city. And there are endless similar examples in both cities. And of course, it's not only a problem that faces medievalists, but archaeologists for all periods and in all towns. Finally, what can medieval archaeology in towns like Acre and Jerusalem contribute to the study of the Crusader period? Certainly, with their importance, extensive remains, and detailed documentation, these two cities offer us the best opportunity to learn about Frankish urban life in the Latin East in all its aspects. In its administration, as can be seen here from the uh, remarkable hospital compound uh, recently or excavated over the past few decades in Acre, and the hospital compound in Jerusalem, which more or less vanished from sight, or a large, section, a large part of it vanished from sight with the uh, dismantling of the early 20th century, urban defences, and here are some examples from Jerusalem, because there are very few examples from Arco of urban defences, but towns, towers, four walls, moats, gates, bastions, citadels. Its communities, which can be observed by urban quarters, the various urban quarters, some of which are being excavated, and this, the photograph here on the right shows the recent excavations being carried out by the IA in the Genoese quarter in Acre. In its daily life, as seen by many examples of domestic architecture, and, in, and as I mentioned before, mainly found in Acre, there are very few examples in Jerusalem, 
but in Acre a great many examples of domestic buildings are found buried under or incorporated in uh, houses in, within the city walls and also beyond the, the Turkish city walls in the new city. And in its daily life, as seen in many examples, once again, of, of de domestic architecture, but also in uh, um, uh, uh, material finds, in commercial life, uh, represented by the covered market streets in Jerusalem, and again by material finds, such as new mass uh, new, uh, uh, coin finds and uh, ceramics, but many other things as well. In industry, and this is another example from Acre of a small uh, in industry directed towards pilgrimage of uh, ampula for holy water or holy oil. In religious life, of course, in the churches, the many churches and monasteries, once again, mainly ob observable in Jerusalem. And in urban culture, in many examples of the fine arts. Urban life was just one facet of the two centuries of Christian rule in the Latin East. Archaeology is unraveling many other aspects of life in the Latin East through the excavations of castles, monasteries, and rural settlements. But the history of the Crusader period is very tightly wrapped to the cities, and in particular to the two major cities. There are more documents about Jerusalem and Acre, be they deeds of sale, notarial lists, inscriptions, pilgrims' accounts, or chronicles, than for any other sites in the Latin East. And more excavations have taken place in the cities than in other sites. The quality, or the quantity, variety, and detail of written documents pertaining to these two cities and the extent of the archaeological remains surviving in both of them make the combined historical archaeological examination of Jerusalem and Acre, in spite of its complexity, the most rewarding study of the Crusader period and one of the most rewarding indeed for any period. Thank you.